Hi, Thomas. Uh, Thomas Heldorf, uh, Vice President of Airlines and Travel at uh, WorldPay from FIS. Uh, thank you very much for joining us. Now, what we're going to do over the next 18, 19 minutes or so, Thomas, no pressure, of course, is try and give a really kind of good overview of the kind of the state of the nation, the big picture of payments. Now, um, if anyone wants to get any of the finer details of what the kind of things that Thomas talks about, uh, us and WorldPay from FIS have done quite a few webinars over the last 18 months and um, frankly they're incredibly good and there's a lot of data and bigger trend analysis in those so you can go back and watch those so uh, a little plug for some of our old webinars there Thomas that we've done many of together but first of all then if we can kick things off is it is it fair for me to say that the payments landscape if we can call it that has been largely unaffected by the last 18 months from a COVID perspective, other than not a lot of payments have been made? <laughs> well, thanks. Um, first of all, welcome. And uh, thanks, Kevin, for the invitation. Um, it's, well, it, it's been a real turmoil, um, I would say, from a payment perspective, in particular for the travel industry, as in, yeah, not so much has changed from a consumer perspective. Consumers still pay the same way that they, that they used to pay. They pay a lot less because they travel a lot less. But from a merchant perspective, from a travel agency and airline perspective, it has become a lot more difficult to accept those payments. And that's because um, many of you will know the acquirer takes the risk for transactions and takes the risk for transactions should an airline default. Now, should an airline default, the acquirer has to pay all unflown tickets because, of course, the consumers are protected against a, a, the cases when services have not been rendered. So they can go back to the issuing bank and say, I forgot my flight, I want my money back. And the issue goes back to the card schemes, the card schemes go back to the acquirer. And if the airline is no longer there, the acquirer has to pay. Or if the travel agency is no longer there, the travel agency has to pay. So that risk has gone up significantly, um, especially since the pandemic. Um, not only did the airline make default, but also the, the chargeback risks. Uh, there's a lot of um, open chargebacks. There's a lot of vouchers that have been issued. So it's a really unclear landscape for acquirers to understand how much liability do they still have with this sector. So it's been a really difficult times for airlines, for travel companies to find acquirers and to work with them and work out a risk um, mitigation compromise in terms of um, how much are the airline acquirers willing to, to, to take that risk. So, so yes, on the consumer side, very little has changed, very little has progressed in terms of variety of payment methods, in terms of new ways to take payment. But, um, but behind the curtains, massive, massive um, movements and massive uh, things have happened. Uh, the whole chargeback, all the, the refunds, it's been, it's been a real nightmare for, for many of us. So, <laughs> I, I've, I've got 10 different subjects that we can get through here, but I do want to kind of um, continue this point just briefly. Is there light at the end of the tunnel for this mess that you've just so described to us? There is, there is, and and some acquirers more than others are taking the opportunity to deepen their relationship with with the market. So we've we're just in the process of signing up a, a lot of new airlines who are um, have to find new acquirers, um, have to find a second acquirer because they've they've had only one and they want the backup uh, because they saw that these relationships can change very quickly. So so we are we are working with a lot of them to to highlight their situation and work with them and say, look, guys, you, you need to just, it's sound business to have two acquirers, to, to have a redundant setup and, and working with them through, I mean, we've gone through the worst. We've gone through all the refunds where we sometimes had to pre-fund the refunds and then later got the money back from the airlines because they were not used to pay us. <laughs> we were paying them. Um, that has changed. And you can imagine with some of the governmental airlines in the middle of a the pandemic, they have to find ways to pay their acquirer. Um, not, not an easy situation in particular at the beginning of it all when, when nobody knew what was happening and how to resolve it. So... So, so it is changing. We, we see sales have long surpassed chargebacks and, and refunds. 
So, so there is certainly um, an, an improvement of the situation and, and we have found ways to mitigate the risk. So we, we've built risk tools that help us to understand the risk and, and to balance the, the risk between the airline and ourselves. Um, so so it, is, it is changing and, and, uh, and I see a lot of um, industry players getting ready to, to, to step into the market and, and, uh, and uh, once the situation improves also to, to join us again in, in that space. One of the uh, most interesting parts that we've we've done, as I mentioned at the beginning, we've done a series of webinars with you over the last couple of mm -hmm. years. And one of the ones that seems to have taken place in the autumn each year is the results of a survey that you do that looks at different payment types, what mm -hmm. type of uh, devices people are using, the whole thing. And it's the, the data that comes out of that is fascinating. I just wondered if, Thomas, you could talk us through what some of the interesting perhaps uh, – uh, results that you might see if you do that same survey again in you know things that are shifting uh, to different types of services and payment types so i think one of the things is what, what is really easy for airlines and travel companies to do is optimize their website i mean we've just previously in the previous discussion heard uh, is the trust that consumers have in your website and there's yeah. a lot of little things that you can do to build the trust as simple as putting a lock symbol on the home page putting a lock symbol Right next to entering the card details, just that that symbol seems to build trust. It, it's interesting. We we were surprised ourselves, but we've we've um, we've uh, had a survey among thirty three thousand uh, consumers across all different uh, countries around the globe, and and we found about twenty thirty different elements that you can build around the entire payment process. So not only on the payment page, but you can start on the home page displaying the payment methods that you have available. Um, ensuring that you describe the process that you take people through when you have certain payment methods that you redirect them. Uh, that there's, there's so many things you can do to improve that experience that don't take much um, to, to actually implement. Equally, there are so many things that distract the payment process and, and if you don't check the card number for its consistency, it has a check digit and all you need to do is calculate the chat digit while you enter the details and give it a tick when it's right and highlight it when it's wrong before somebody enters the submit button and then it goes off and comes back with a big arrow and, and people drop off. So there, there's so many things you can do really just very simply to, to increase the conversion. So that, that, that is one of the most yeah. fascinating things. It's, it's a simple uh, thing that, that you can it, do. It, it, it's, interesting. it's interesting though because, you know, as a fairly regular user of e-commerce sites that's the kind of functionality that you don't see in a particularly widespread way yeah. but it seems so simple to do something like that T taking the name from from the lead passenger and putting that into the into the card holder name field like just copy and paste it in automatically reduces the data entry required especially if you book on a mobile phone you have to re-enter your name type it in again on your phone it, it's these little things and, and you want to get to a almost like the, the Uber or Amazon experience where, where you have stored all your passengers' details and all they need to do is just a fingerprint on the phone, reconfirm the payment method, and, and, and it's paid, especially for incremental bookings or incremental um, service elements as, as airlines and travel companies try to sell more, not only at the initial booking, but the insurance, the, 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 the transportation, taxi, larger seat, upgrade, whatever. Um, use the stored payment details. Just get him to just put the finger and, and, and yes, I want it now. So it's this, this spontaneous um, purchases that you support with a really, really good, slick user experience. Talk us through, Thomas, if you can, what are some of the emerging or even new alternative payment methods that the industry should be aware of? Yeah, so I guess the, the, the most interesting is the discussion in this space I think, is the, the open banking discussion. So should airlines, travel companies adopt open banking? Now, from a merchant perspective, it's brilliant. Open banking is super cheap. It, it's pennies instead of percentages of transaction value. And, and, and I had a lot of queries, like, should we implement this? Yes. And, and yeah, if you, if you look at purely from a, from a merchant perspective, it, it might be a really good one. Um, having said that, um, if you look at it from, from a consumer perspective, one thing that we, we, we covered about is that the trust and the, the chargeback capabilities and stuff. Open banking doesn't really provide that. You pay, it's done, and that money is gone. And, and if there's a company goes bust, it, it's gone. There is no chargeback rights. And, and you don't get miles, you don't get the insurance, you don't get all these extra bits that customers got used 
to have around credit cards. And, and you'd almost need to rebuild those incentives and that protection around open banking to encourage users to, to use it. So some airlines I've seen, they offer free upgrades and, and they go down that, may, that, that route to, to, to encourage users of free bags or, or things um, to, to enable them to, or to incentivize users to use those payment methods. We've we've talked before, and there's been a lot of discussion in the past about you know the cashless travel experience, and you know the the kind of the emerging role of things such as biometrics, which is obviously part consumer related and the way they interact with how they want to pay for things. Where are we broadly in that kind of new world of being able to pay thing pay for things like that? Yeah, so it's the it's the user experience at the very front that keeps evolving, and and, yeah. and fingerprint biometric it it's 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 a beautiful development uh, of of having to enter a pin and, and any sort of other um, protection um, steps, um, and it, it's predominantly driven out of or one element is is driven out of the requirements to two factor authenticate, and this is where governments sometimes step in and and and. And almost, they think it's gone too far in, in that ideal <laughs> experience where all you need to do is click yes and and or, or smile or to get your service, and 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 it's almost too seamless that that process. People don't realize that they're buying something, so they want that double step. Uh, yes, I really want to pay, and do you really mean want to pay? Yes, and and you double kind of <laughs> authenticate your transaction to ensure that you really that it's really you, that it's safe, it's secure, and. And certainly, it, it helps many to to build that trust, but it kind of disrupts sometimes that that totally seamless user experience where you just nod or just click yes and it's done. So there's this two there's this tension between security, safety. Um, it's all kind of really really um, trusted and 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 this ideal optimal user experience. And and everybody's kind of needs to find their own preferences and where they would like to sit. And obviously, for the merchant state sometimes would like to have the easiest way in terms of payment conversion and the highest conversion security always wins though in no. that kind of in that balance that you talk about between security and brilliant user experience does it i, I, I mean there's there's the regulation that you have to fulfill mm -hmm. but but there's still in in if you have the conversation between the fraud teams and the, and the sales teams within an airline or within the travel organization the fraud team, it really they have zero fraud, but then you just shut down the website and there's no fraud. Brilliant. <laughs> but that's not what it's about. It's about maximizing sales. And the sales seems like do away with that fraud product because it just reduces my convers my conversion. So it's about the business to decide how much fraud do you accept? Um, and, and how much it's almost like okay, we, we accept a zero point whatever, zero five percentage level of fraud because there will always be fraud. And 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 we just add it to the price, and 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 we find kind of a balance between turning away good customers and 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 having no fraud. So the tighter you make your fraud rules, obviously, the more you turn away good good people. And and the good example was um, when the pandemic started, um, a lot of people booked last minute one way flights in business class in all sorts of like. And this is a typical example where fraud rules normally would kick in early and say one way tickets expensive really short term is something I, I turn down. So this is where people really quickly had to adjust those fraud rules and like, hang on, these automated tools are good, but but I need to <laughs> I need to adjust it a little bit. So there is always fraud is always going to be there. It's it's just a matter of how much fraud do you add to your business case and 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 find good tools, obviously, that help you to <laughs> optimize the good transactions and turn down as, as, as few um, good ones as possible and, and, and turn turn away the bad ones. Okay. Uh, Linda, my colleague, and uh, Will Plummer just a moment ago referenced uh, blockchain and, uh, mm. and and that kind of emerging um, kind of mechanism. I mean, what's your, what's your perspective yeah. on, on um, that, Tommy? I think that... It, it, it sounds intriguing that you open up another payment method and lots of people will, will pay more flights that they would have bought and paid for before. I'm, 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 I've seen a couple of implementations. Um, all of them use an exchange where they obviously immediately convert the, 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 
digit currencies into interfere currency. So they, Elon knows what they get. They wouldn't natively accept Bitcoins because they keep changing the value. And airlines traditionally hedge every currency and everything. So they, they wouldn't necessarily <laughs> want to have Bitcoins and get into the business of speculating with Bitcoins. So, so there is a way to, to safely accept uh, cryptocurrencies and digital currencies. Uh, what I would though say is that, that what about the unhappy path? What about the refunds? What about um, all, all these kind of where, where you try to issue a ticket and it didn't work and you need to kind of cancel that transaction? These use cases, these edge cases, they're not so easily doable with exchanging fiat into, or crypto into fiat and then you have it and all of a sudden you don't want that transaction and then you want to convert it back and then prices have changed and you only get half of your Bitcoins back. Or you do a refund a week later because that flight has been canceled. So, so, so all these edge cases, um, digital currencies are not really geared up for these kind of transaction types. <laughs> mm. uh, open banking, open banking is, is easy for the happy path, um, but it's hard to 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 adjust to, to and find a way around all these um, other use cases, the unhappy paths. And as, as we come to the end here, we've uh, inevitably just whizzed through all this and not come to some of the topics that I wanted us to cover. But, you know, what what is kind of coming next in the world of payments? And that seems a really kind of glib question to ask, but, you know, uh, perhaps not for me. But if I was a travel executive, you know, what is coming that's going to kind of set my hair on fire because I haven't thought of it yet or it's going to be a big headache to implement technically or financially or through any of the other things that payments can cause issues for what's next yeah so two things i i, I see coming and interesting one of them is um the, the whole b2b payment process that that is that is really very old in the airline world and and uh, really not working very well uh, in the in the travel agency to supplier world there yeah. There are options. There, there is the virtual credit cards. There's the the BSB cash. Um, some are really expensive. Some are really kind of might need a refresh, a technical refresh. So I think there's there's a lot of opportunity to look into that space and optimize the whole B two B flow uh, in terms of how the money is moved, how the money is guaranteed, how it is ensured that that the downstream suppliers are actually going to survive, or the upstream suppliers are going to be there, and when there's a charge break. So, so the whole ecosystem, the dependencies and the guarantees for each other, I think there's a huge opportunity to, to do a lot in that space. The just just on that then, because it is it would be such a fundamental change. Mm. Is it is it if it's the airlines? side of things is it an organization like iata that is or should taking the lead or is it going to happen a bit more organically because airlines themselves are demanding some really big changes because the system is yeah. not working for them yeah so i think ndc is a good opportunity because the, yeah. the payment flow around ndc is still very fragmented open and, and i hope that there are solutions going to come up and then with the help of iata we can standardize some of those solutions and, yeah. and make them industry solutions. So this is this is the way I hope things things are, are going to move. And then from a, a B2C side, I think um, mm -hmm. an interesting development are the, the, the digital uh, currencies that governments are issuing, the, the, the CBDCs. Um, how are we going to be able to, to accept them? Could we use those for B2B payments as well? So, so how do we adopt our our industry standards, the IATA standards around the, the tickets, the, the forms of payments in tickets? Once those digital currency units arrive and are becoming commonly accepted, how, how do we how do we embed them into our ecosystem? So that that, that that's a really really interesting one for me, um, and I think we should keep an eye out uh, for those. And um, as China has is already testing them, the US on them, UK, Singapore. Lots of governments are working on those, and 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 knowing the time it takes for us to adopt that <laughs> industry to anything new, uh, it'd be a good time to start the thinking now, to be ready in whatever three five years or, or even shorter to, to actually be able to accept those. Okay, so lots of things there to keep you out of mischief as everyone as well as everybody else in the travel industry. So, uh, Thomas Heldorf from uh, WorldPay from FIS. 
Thank you very much as always. Good to see Thank you. you. And, uh, thanks for finishing our Focus Wire Pulse off today. Uh, mm-hmm. So that's enough uh, from me and my team. I'm just going to hand over to Pete Como, uh, the Managing Director of Focus Right. Thanks again, Thomas. Thanks, everyone. Good evening. Good afternoon.